and welcome to Theory Craft. My name is Ben. Over here to my left, in my well, technically right, but on my left in real life, is my co-host Jack. We are two dudes that like to rant, rave, and ramble all things comic books, sci-fi, whether it be TV series, movies, or just pure random films and TV series gone by. For this week is purely speculation, as we are, I wouldn't say experts in the terms of like crafting theories for things, but we have been doing quite well for the past year. And it's purely speculation on what the Loki Disney Plus TV series is going to entail. So, for the most part, the MCU has gone by basically saying that the whole shenanigans of time travel is based around the branch universe theory. Yeah. For those of you who may not know what that is, it basically means, if you have a look at my lovely whiteboard. So... <laughs> Here we have the MCU timeline in black. From start over, where is it? Let's just see where my hand is. Right, over on this side of the screen is the beginning of the MCU. Where the big massive black line is, is where the Loki variant occurs in the timeline and goes from there in a green line to indicate that it branches off from that reality. Hence the name Branch Universe Theory in Time Travel, whereby whatever you change in the past creates a whole new future that doesn't implicate the future that you're already from. But the thing is, this whole concept of Branch Universe Theory works brilliantly until we heard the news, probably what, a month ago, give or take, that Loki was supposed to appear in the next Thor movie, Love and Thunder, which was meant to be the Loki variant from the Loki TV series, not the Loki that died in Infinity War. Yes. Which gives us a hell of a headache to try and grasp what the hell is going on. But for me personally, I've been trying to figure out all these little tidbit ideas that we've heard recently in terms of the multiverse coming and all the future MCU movies, which implicates in time travel to a degree as to how it all coalesces into what's going on so for instance we've had so many things the past few weeks where we've had past actors from previous spider-man movies that's come along and has decided to reprise their role as said bad guy which is brilliant but it makes things a bit more confusing if it's going to be premise of the multiverse theory which is a highly different theory compared to the branch universe theory. Well, exactly. I mean, like when we've been going through so much of uh, what I've been covering a lot on Spider-Man and with the whole branch universe theory and so, so much to do with alternate realities and so on, because obviously we're getting all three original uh, Spider-Men back, so uh, all the original actors. But then it kind of begs the question to me that I've been trying to think about how would I write this film? I'm trying to figure out what they may do. And I've been trying to rack my brain of how they're going to write this in, how it's going to work, how they all exist around about the same time in like one, this one timeline. And for the life of me, I can't think of anything. I can't work it out at all. Well, this is it. I mean, for my theory number one, in terms of how we are getting this whole concept of the multiverse, it's... Pretty much everything that's been pre-MCU. So you've got the Tobey Maguire, the Andrew Garfield, the entirety of the Fox X-Men saga, mm. is that because of Loki branching reality breaking it, as well as Wanda breaking reality with her TV series, and probably other reasons within the MCU in the next few movies, that it's weakened the barriers to those realities or perhaps even in some bizarre way created those realities? Maybe, maybe. Well, so the main reason why we had so many different X-Men movies and Spider-Man movies was because Marvel's going bust in the late 90s due to their own stupidity and flooding the market of comics to the point where they weren't making any money. So to save themselves, they had to sell certain characters to certain movie rights, and thus we got the various movies that we've become to love 
and eventually got the MCU. And it's a bit of an iffy one, obviously, because there were certain characters that did want to try and cross over, but there was a lot of contracts and iffiness that had to try and Contracts, figure out. Co copyrights and all that. Yeah, there were certain things that they couldn't do due to complications until the House of Mouse decided to buy everybody and now everybody lives under the same roof. Yeah. But my thought going is that in some bizarre logic that maybe the MCU was the main timeline all along. And so between all the breaking of said reality, you get splintered realities where there's only certain characters. Hence why we get the only Tobey Maguire Spidey and the Andrew Garfield Spidey, but there's no Avengers in that reality. And so the same going for the X-Men, where they do exist in the MCU, but they haven't been found yet. But they exist in a different reality due to the whole... Boom! Like, that, everything just went... Just broke. Yeah, however, the whole X, however, the whole X Men thing, how to introduce them to the MCU. That is a video which we did a little while ago. So please go check that out to see how we can introduce them. But yeah, I see what you mean with these branch realities and so on. It's just obviously it's a really cool concept. As like you, as like you know, obviously, and like for anybody watching this in the future, we love to talk about time travel, branch realities, so on a lot on this channel. And it's one of the most really cool things and really cool tropes which has been done through films and series and so on but it is stupendously hard to execute well without confusing the living hell out of people well the thing is every time traveling plot movie always contradicts itself regardless because you either have ones where it's inevitable that it's going to happen such as say terminator for instance the whole premise where they go back in time to basically wipe out the guy, future guy, sorry, that is supposed to rise up against machines. Yeah. But in doing so, you send back a random guy who ends up being the sperm donor. I won't say father because he didn't even stay alive and long enough to be the father. He was literally the sperm donor to become the biological dad to the guy that creates a revolution in the future. So it ends up becoming a time loop that nobody can stop or control. But then you get such things like Back to the Future where you go to Back to the Past, you mess about, you end up creating certain things that shouldn't have happened, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And basically you have to live with what reality you end up with unless you're able to go back and undo said Thing and it just uh. yeah exactly i mean there was something which um now we're on this like on this really horrible subject as it's a massive headache and um because when i was doing a i was doing an instagram live for my own youtube channel earlier on and when i was talking about some which I've spoken about a lot on my other channel, which was about uh, the multiversal theory the, or like the multiple earth theory so I think that is a possibility which could come into like things like the Spider-Man film and so on, but it's just trying to work out how you're going to end up using those, I wouldn't say excuses, but those kind of plot devices to pluck out how is the Green Goblin alive, how is Doc Ock alive, but then it's going to go into Loki as well, so obviously you're going to have the from the first, from the first Avengers Loki that buggered off and is now going to appear in Thor Love and Thunder. Yes. Yes. So the whole implication is obviously Loki gets the Tesseract. I don't really understand as to why he he's always had an obsession with it throughout the entirety of the MCU. When the whole premise of the Tesseract is basically that it's actually the Space Stone. The only thing that you can do with the Space Stone is basically transport throughout space. Like you can end up anywhere, anywhere any part of the galaxy or any part of the universe. So with the implication that it's a Tesseract, like, I'm trying to figure out what mischief does it cause for him to then end up being captured by what's called the TVA, the Time Variant Association. And basically they use him as some sort of weird consultant type thing where 
he's there to fix variations within the timeline to prevent certain cataclysmic events happening to create said cataclysmic timelines. Well, that's the thing. When it comes to like the the time stones, like all the like, all the stones having their own individual properties and so on, but at the same time, to manipulate space, it will manipulate time and vice versa. So there's not really much escaping that. So there may be something to do with the uh, with the time stone, possibly with like maybe Doctor Strange coming with Doctor Strange being back in the fold. It's just without. You can't bend space without bending time. And it's just a dodgy line to walk. <laughs> this is it. But the next theory that I have is sort of centred around as to how big an implication Loki being a variant has. So the thing is, I wondered, since Loki in that timeline didn't get captured and sent back to Asgard, he wouldn't have been part of Thor 2, the Dark World. So then he wouldn't have dethroned Odin and took over and pretended to be him. So then Ragnarok technically wouldn't have happened. So would that timeline have been a better timeline or not? So what you're saying is, like, that timeline, so the timeline that we got, like, most of that timeline wouldn't have even... Wouldn't have even followed through, pretty much. Yeah, because at the end of Avengers, because obviously, at the end, of, end of the obviously Avengers, he has this arc where he goes through a sort of redemption, but sort of doesn't. But then, obviously, like you said, Ragnarok would likely never would likely never have happened. But then, that leads him from after they take after they take the Tesseract. What's going on in that timeline still? Because now they don't have the Space Stone. So, where is it in that timeline now? <laughs> Well, this is the thing, because one other thing I just realised as well is the fact that if he's technically got the Tesseract with him, until they explain it in the show, we don't have a clue. But if he's not, if he's keeping hold of the Tesseract for himself, because it's Loki, that means that obviously Thanos wouldn't have it. So therefore, no one would have been snapped or blipped in that timeline. No, because he needed so the entire circuit of them for it to work. Yeah so, the, yeah, so obviously the snap would never have happened in that nope. timeline. So then within that timeline, what exactly... I mean, it's the only thing I can say is that it's obvious that Thanos knew where the Asgardians were on the ship because Loki obviously hailed for them because he's worked with them previously. That's how he got part of the Chitauri people in the first place. Although that would technically mean that if... That means Ragnarok does. If that means Ragnarok never happened, that means that like, Loki would most likely would he go back to Asgard? Would you say? No. See, I would say he'd go back to Jofelheim, which is where he's technically from, to basically dethrone his biological frost giant father, Maybe, and yeah. go from there. Because the whole thing within Thor, the first movie, was that Loki was miffed off because he was basically a dwarf ice baby that was kicked out basically and Odin took hold of him but didn't like the fact that Odin belittled him for not being his own son Yeah, and basically held a grudge ever since. That's why there was a whole shenanigans in Thor, the first movie but it's a very weird one because Loki by nature is obviously the god of mischief so he's always going to have some idea of manipulating and perhaps antagonising random beings just for the sake of doing it. But it also means what is there for him to do with the Space Stone? Like, I mean, he's not technically immortal. Like, they age slow. They did say within Thor that they're not actually gods. They're just perceived as gods because of their longevity. They sort of age a, bit, a lot slower compared to humanity. So... What on earth would keep Loki busy enough for like a good thousand years, give or take, which is like relatively a year in human time, so he doesn't end up getting bored and destroying the entire universe? <laughs> well, yeah, if he, has the, if he has the space stone, just go around and just, I know he's a god of mischief and everything, but just cause him mischief just for the sake of it. He has to have a justifiable reason to having the Tesseract. What's he going to do? There has to be a, just a proper reason. Well, this is what I've been trying to figure out because for the most part, Loki's attitude 
it's been sort of linked to the idea of a teenager rebelling against their parents, which I kind of get. But the guy is basically able to shapeshift, be able to create illusions, be able to just manipulate people so easily just for the sheer fun of it. So I'm trying to understand what he's trying to achieve with the Space Stone if he's just basically going to random planets and just messing about? I don't I don't know. They're just... I've been trying to rack my brain, trying to figure out what the plot could be or what he may be doing, and I have... I, I got nothing. I can't figure this out whatsoever. But for the most part, the whole series is basically using Loki as kind of like a Hannibal Lecter sort of S character where... They use him as a way to perhaps figure out or fix certain situations because they don't see or think in the same mindset as him. So my third and final theory is whether Loki fixing things is how we end up getting the implication of the Fantastic Four, the X-Men and other missing characters because... This is the big thing that we've been trying for so long to figure out where in the timeline everybody fits. And yeah, because obviously, like we, because I remember we did a video a little while ago where it could, in, where like obviously we were speaking about it, could introduce like the Fantastic Four. And obviously, you got to put the X Men in there somewhere because of the timeline. But then obviously, the next question is going to come up. Yeah, but where were they the whole time? It's just a massive cluster fudge in the brain. I mean, the thing is, the whole premise of X-Men is that people mutate through either stress or because of being at a certain peak in time of being a teenager. Well, yeah. Have you seen where we live? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, to be fair, Devin's got his fair share of mutants anyway, but that's a whole <laughs> other thing in itself. No, they're just the regular people. They've not even mutated yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, swift, swiftly moving on. <laughs> but the thing that I'm trying to sort of understand is, like, in the world of Marvel, it's quite a stressful thing regardless. Yeah. So why hasn't... There's not many mutants that technically have their powers from the day they're born. Like, there's a very select few, because obviously they have the physical mutation. No. No, I but, haven't... That's a good point. I never actually thought about that. So I'm trying to understand how much stress and strain do you have to live through within the MCU when you consider the fact, like, how much of it has gone so bonkers within the space of five years because you end... You get Iron Man, you get Thor, you get Iron Man 2, you get... Uh... You get Avengers. Basically, it doesn't really, like, it's not much within, like, a few years of itself. No. And yet, nobody seems to sort of be like, oh, it's, yeah, this is like, this is fine. It's like, ah! Like, this, <laughs> I, the thing is, as well, I just don't understand how anybody doesn't, like, end up being blown up just by stepping outside their door. <laughs> like <laughs> Iron Man got blown up at home. They they, they had a ra massive rocket just flying through his Malibu home because he was stupid enough to give away his address. Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is like obviously within the whole MCU that you got the SSR, which eventually becomes Shield. Peggy Carter in her very short run series did showcase that there were a lot of random things that couldn't be explained, which they later on sort of revealed down the line. But again, it's these things where, if that's the case, if this happened back in like the late 50s, how come nothing happened within those 50 years? Like, there's so many other points within the MCU that bugs me, that there's so much gappage between like how... It just randomly happened because it's like you get Captain America is like the technically the first ever superhero within the whole concept of the MCU. 
So obviously everything from Captain America, everyone's been obsessed around the idea of the super soldier thing. And you get that within the Falcon and Winter Soldier series, which was brilliant. But it's like, but how is it that it took them almost a hundred years because it's now set in like 2023, the MCU to then retry the serum again, because they try to degree, like say that it's been spread out throughout decades, but I think there was a minor hint towards it in Jessica Jones because that's how she got her abilities by saying that they experimented on her with a variant of it. And then you're supposed to be like, there's the variant of it for the Black Widow series, well, film that's coming out. But what about the other batshit crazy stuff that happens within the MCU? Like, you got Howard Stark that has like the most advanced tech each decade. You got Hank Pym that basically creates the ultimate assassin suit where you can shrink and be able to beat the living crap out of anyone without being seen. Oh uh, yeah, because I remember talking of like Hank Pym. I do you remember when it was just before Avengers Endgame came out? Because everybody was saying that Ant Man was going to be the one who was going to kill Thanos, and then there was all those memes that came out about him shrinking down to a small size, going up his somewhere, and then yeah, yeah. growing large. So <laughs> yeah, um, I remember I just... when all those memes came out. <laughs> God, I just. I... I don't understand why people had that obsession with that. I really don't. Like, but did you really think that's how it was going to end? Really? <laughs> no, God, no. Like, the thing is, like, that wouldn't work. Not to be funny, but Thanos is like a guy that came from Titan. Okay, like one of Saturn's moon. His durability is pretty damn intense, inside and out. So unless he ends, like Ant Man grew. To the size of, say, the Statue of Liberty in the space of a second, if not less than that, I don't think the sheer force and strength of it would be enough to just... Although, the thing with that man going through, obviously, you know, you have the quantum realm and so on, which is a really cool concept, which I do like the way they've done it, but there is a few other things when it comes to actually shrinking down to go through the quantum realm and so on, shrinking to the size of an atom, that there is something which just really bugs me. That when it comes to, I can't remember exactly, but when he go, grows to, like to say, the size of a, the Statue of Liberty, does he stay the same weight as he does when he's regular size? So the thing is with the pin particles is that it's technically two different types. So it's like positive and negative to a degree. Like it's the same formula in a way but it's like structured differently so you have different ways of it working so when it's that's why you get i believe it's it's red ones for shrinking it's blue ones for growing so basically like it increases the mass the strength and the durability but with the shrinking ones you keep your strength you keep your like size and weight relative but the like actual size of you shrinks if that makes sense i was gonna say if your weight is still gonna be the same like if your weight is still gonna be the same and maybe like the tiny version of you still should have the strength to like kick somebody in the leg with the same amount of force then well yeah that's how it kind of works to a degree like it's a bit of an iffy one. I still don't fully understand the whole science of it. There is so many different people that have tried explaining it over the years. And until someone actually scientifically makes it, which I wouldn't be surprised if it came from China or Japan first, just because. Well, they're, well, they're pretty much already building like animatronic. They're pretty much building like Transformers <laughs> in Japan. Yeah, they got their own Gundams as it is. But we, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things where the science within the MCU, it's a very weird one where they've got so many gaps within the like, advancements. I don't understand where the rest of it comes in. I mean... Yeah, I, and there's another thing, which the constant advancements in the technology and so on, when you, go, when, uh, you have Captain America and Tony, when they go out to... Uh, the middle of a desert to like, find the Tesseract again, to find the cube, and you have all this advanced technology spread all around them in this massive lab. 
and you think how advanced you, the technology is throughout the films. But yet, at the same time, Tony Stark is able to create a new element just with a load of plumbing material in his living room, basically. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's just the logic of comic books and sci-fi that you just go, oh, you just had it lying about, which is fair enough. I mean, like at the end of the day, this guy is an absolute genius. But I would love to try and figure out as to whether or not the Fantastic Four could have been perhaps a team linked to Ant-Man in a way, because one theory going is that the Fantastic Four could be part of the, a team that was in the 70s exploring the quantum realm yeah, and end up coming out the other side to 2023 and basically because of being prolonged within the quantum realm for so long they gain abilities which is fair enough because for whatever reason Janet does get some weird abilities in Ant-Man and the Wasp for being in the quantum realm for so long. But again, it's one of these things where because it has like quantum tunnels, that's the whole thing with the quantum tunnel itself is like there's multiple different variations. And so you could end up going through one end and coming out like five years later, or you could coming out the one another way and it could be like, two seconds later like there's no definitive way because there's no roadmap for it all yeah although five although five five years in five years in the physical five years in the physical in physical time from the physical world whereas in the quantum realm be only like five hours maybe a couple of hours yeah but the thing is i'm trying the big thing that i'm still trying to figure out is how does Loki get back to the main timeline? Because the thing is, when the Sorcerer Supreme, or the Ancient One, whichever name you want to go by, basically said to Hulk during Endgame that if he were to take the stone, it would create a whole new variant. The only way that it could end up going back to the way it should is by putting it back to the moment where they took it from. So I'm trying to figure out whether Loki actually did survive from being beaten by a pulp from Thanos and hid for so long or he finds some bizarre way of going into the timeline that is the correct timeline I don't know because then you had Cap and then you had Cap that took the stones to go back to the various different points in time to put the stones back where they were but then that creates new timelines in itself because then they're back where they should be, but then that means those timers are going to carry on again. Oh, it's so confusing. <laughs> I mean, the supposedly the directors have said that it was always going to be a time loop with Steve. So the whole concept was that Steve lived from the point that he went back to, and it was basically a constant loop. So there was always at least two Steves within that timeline. But then it still implicates the idea as to obviously the butterfly effect that by changing the past that it creates supposed the ripple effects for the future but does that mean that steve basically created the timeline of the mcu to end up setting up what we got because if he hadn't have gone back then there wouldn't have been so many implications like say tony going and get kidnapped by the Taliban or the Ten Rings or whatever you want to call them. Because if Steve had lived throughout the entire MCU, 2008, how old would Steve have been then? He would have been, well, physically he would have been, what, about 80 or so? Um, Something like that, but obviously with the Super Soldier Serum, it'd be different because of his ageing and so on. Well, the thing is, like, it doesn't slow down the aging so much. It just basically makes you more durable and physically fit. So technically, an 80-year-old version of Steve would still be fighting fit enough to go and save Steve. Uh, sorry, uh, Tony. But because he knew that moment had to be what it was, it means that he had to basically allow Tony to go through quite a lot of trauma to become Iron Man. 
Yeah, well, in a way, it kind of goes back to the butterfly effect or even the multiver- multiversal theory that, um, like, when there's when I was talking about the theory that every choice that you make has an effect, so every choice that you make has an effect in another timeline. So there's another separate Earth, another separate reality, which is carrying on from that other choice. So there may be one version of you that chose to go on holiday to Italy, but there was the other one who chose to stay at home. You know, things like that. So... It just depends. So that's the way I think maybe they may be able to go back to that multiple earth theory, which I think may come into play in these films, as I can't think of really any other way they can really sort of displace or tell like tell that story in a way, just because they're maybe through possibly Madam Web. Although if there is any Madam Web, like for Spider-Man, they're probably keeping it very quiet. But I can't really see any other way of doing it. But then you've got Doctor Strange. So seeing the other realities, seeing the consequences of like maybe some of the choices which the characters make can make a difference to the stories possibly. But that's really maybe the only other explanation that they may be able to justify what's going on. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be amazing to see such a big crossover in terms of previous characters, previous ideas. And while I'm sure there's probably going to be hints within the Loki series of prior movies where you got the X-Men and so on, it's still a bit of a headache to try and figure out as to what's going to be the implication from all of it if he's going to be messing about with a lot of reality yeah sure but that's pretty much it for this ranty episode again it was speculation it's just a lot of if buts and maybes and so next week is going to be jack ranting and raving about something random which is going to be what exactly well what that's going to be about is something which i've sort of discovered my love for in the past um year and a half or so obviously We've all had to go through the whole lockdown thing and this whole pandemic and it's been a nightmare and it's had its tough moments for all of us, but it has given us all a chance to find some new hobbies, find some new interests and discover old loves again. I've discovered my old love for, well, I guess now you could call it retro gaming. So you got PS1, PS2, PS3. I've been back to playing the PS2, so many games on then. Kind of rediscovered my love for it again. So I really want to try and delve into why I feel that in mine and Ben's childhood, when we were a bit younger and things were a lot more simple, where we didn't have much to worry about, back then gaming was probably at its very best. And I know there's the advancements of um, the different consoles and so on, the consoles are advancing, but at the same time, it's getting so much more expensive and variety is getting so low. Whereas back when we were younger we had so much variety in games it was endless you can guarantee whatever film whatever series whatever little small series or like spin-offs whatever there was definitely a game for everything so i just really want to try and go back to the magic of what was gaming back in the day and i feel like i can actually say back in the day now (laughs) oh god don't make me feel old please (laughs) i'm gonna be 30 this year folks i feel Flipping old enough yeah. as it is. And now I'm I'm halfway to fifty. <laughs> uh, you're halfway there. <laughs> anyway, don't sing the rest so, of that song. Otherwise, we'll get copyright struck. <laughs> no, definitely not. But again, thank you for joining us, everybody. We are live every Sunday on Twitch. We have our own YouTube channel, which is in the links down below. Again, while there is COVID slowly easing here in the UK, stay home, stay safe. And stay sensible, folks. See you soon. See you later.